In this section, I'm going to be considering the application of the Fourier transform to circuit analysis. To begin, I'll very briefly introduce electronic circuits. Then I'll consider the use of the Fourier transform in analyzing such circuits. Electronic circuits are pervasive in the world in which we live, appearing in consumer electronic devices such as phones and computers, home appliances such as microwave ovens and dishwashers, medical equipment and devices such as pacemakers and MRI machines, transportation devices such as aircraft and automobiles, and the list goes on and on. So what precisely do we mean when we speak of an electronic circuit? Well, an electronic circuit is simply a network of one or more interconnected circuit elements. Although many types of circuit elements exist, the three most basic types are resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Each of these types of circuit elements will be considered in more detail shortly. When dealing with electronic circuits, two physical quantities of fundamental importance are voltage and current. Current is a measure of the rate at which electric charge flows through some part of a circuit, such as through a particular circuit element. Voltage is a difference in electric potential between two points in a circuit, such as across a particular circuit element. Essentially, voltage is the force that causes electric charge to flow in a circuit. In particular, current flows in the direction of high electric potential to low electric potential, much in the same way that water flows from high gravitational potential, in other words, high elevation, to low gravitational potential, in other words, low elevation. Lastly, current is measured in the unit of the ampere, abbreviated as the capital letter A, and voltage is measured in the unit of the volt, abbreviated as the capital letter V. The first type of circuit element that I'd like to consider is known as a resistor. A resistor is a circuit element that opposes the flow of current and is characterized by an equation having this particular form here, where R is a non-negative real constant and V and I are respectively the voltage across and current through the resistor as a function of time. As a matter of terminology, the quantity R that appears in this equation is known as the resistance of the resistor and is a measure of how much the resistor opposes the flow of current. The larger the resistance is, the more a resistor opposes current flow. Resistance is measured in the unit of the ohm, which is abbreviated as the Greek capital letter omega, which is this letter here. Often circuits are represented in pictorial form using what is called a schematic or circuit diagram. In such a diagram, a resistor is depicted using this symbol shown here, with the resistor being labeled with its resistance R. The next type of circuit element that I'd like to consider is known as an inductor. An inductor is a circuit element that converts electrical energy associated with an electric current to energy stored in a magnetic field, and vice versa. By using energy stored in a magnetic field, an inductor acts so as to oppose any change in the current passing through the inductor. In physical terms, an inductor consists of an insulated wire wound into a coil. Mathematically, an inductor is characterized by an equation of this particular form here, where L is a non-negative real constant, and V and I respectively denote the voltage across and current through the inductor as a function of time. As a matter of terminology, the quantity L appearing in this equation is known as the inductance of the inductor. The larger the inductance is, the more an inductor opposes changes in the current passing through the inductor. As a practical matter, inductance is measured in the unit of the Henry, which is abbreviated as the capital letter H. In circuit diagrams, an inductor is depicted using the symbol shown here at the bottom of the slide, with the inductor being labeled by its inductance L. The last type of circuit element that I'd like to consider is known as a capacitor. A capacitor is a circuit element that converts electrical energy associated with an electric current to energy stored in an electric field and vice versa. By using energy stored in an electric field, a capacitor acts so as to oppose any change in the voltage across the capacitor. In physical terms, a capacitor consists of two electrical conductors, such as two metallic plates, separated by a non-conducting dielectric material, such as glass, ceramic, or air. 
Mathematically, a capacitor is characterized by an equation of this particular form here, where C is a non-negative real constant, and V and I respectively denote the voltage across and current through the capacitor as a function of time. As a matter of terminology, the quantity C appearing in this equation is known as the capacitance of the capacitor. The larger the capacitance is, the more a capacitor opposes changes to the voltage across the capacitor. As a practical matter, capacitance is measured in the unit of the farad, which is abbreviated as the capital letter F. Lastly, in circuit diagrams, a capacitor is depicted using the symbol shown at the bottom of the slide here, with the capacitor being labeled with its capacitance C. As it turns out, the Fourier transform is a very useful tool for analyzing circuits, especially when inductors and capacitors are involved. The utility of the Fourier transform is partly due to the fact that the differential and integral equations that characterize inductors and capacitors become much simpler when expressed in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. To illustrate this point, let's consider what the equations characterizing a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor look like in the frequency domain. To this end, let little v and little i denote the voltage across and current through a circuit element, such as a resistor, an inductor, or a capacitor, and let big v and big i denote the Fourier transforms of little v and little i respectively. In the frequency domain, the equations characterizing a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor respectively become these three equations here. What's particularly noteworthy about these equations is that they don't contain any differentiation or integration operations. Recall that in the time domain, the equations that characterize inductors and capacitors involve derivatives or integrals. In the frequency domain, however, no differentiation or integration operations are present. In effect, these operations have been replaced by multiplication and division by j omega. Clearly, this makes equations involving inductors and capacitors much easier to handle in the frequency domain than in the time domain. And herein lies one of the major benefits of using the Fourier transform for circuit analysis. At this point, I'd like to consider a simple circuit analysis example. And in particular, I'd like to consider example 6.40. In this example, we're given an electronic circuit that's LTI and consists of a single resistor and single inductor connected in the manner shown in the figure here. The input of the system is the voltage little v1, in other words, the voltage between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. And the output of the system is the voltage little v2, in other words, the voltage between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. In this example, we're asked to do two things. In part A of the example, we're asked to find the frequency response big H of the system. And in part B, we're asked to find the response little v2 of the system to the input little v1, where little v1 is given by this particular formula here. As the first step in the solution process, I'm going to write some equations that characterize the behavior of this system in the time domain. To make this easier to do, I'm going to first label a circuit diagram with the voltage drop across each circuit element. First, let's consider the resistor. So if you recall, the voltage drop across a resistor is equal to the resistance of the resistor times the current passing through the resistor. So in this case, the resistance of this resistor is clearly R, and the current passing through this resistor is I. So the voltage drop across this resistor will simply be the product of these two quantities, in other words, R times I. Now let's consider the inductor. So if you recall, the voltage drop across an inductor is equal to the inductance of the inductor times the derivative of the current passing through the inductor. In this particular case, the current passing through the inductor is the same as the current passing through this resistor here because they're connected in series. So the current passing through this inductor will be equal to I. So the voltage drop across this inductor will be the inductance L times the first derivative of the current passing through the inductor, which is the first derivative of I. With all of the voltage drops in the circuit diagram now labeled, 
It's relatively easy to write some equations that describe the behavior of this system. So first consider the voltage drop between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. We have two different expressions that we can label this voltage drop with. The first is V1, but alternatively we can label it as the sum of the voltage drop across this resistor and the voltage drop across this inductor. In other words, we have that V1 is equal to this expression here in the annotation, which is the voltage drop across the resistor, plus the expression in this annotation here, which is the voltage drop across the inductor. And this gives us this first equation here. Next, let's consider the voltage drop between this point in the circuit here and this point in the circuit here. We can write two different expressions for this voltage drop. The first is simply just V2. But an alternative expression that we can write is that this voltage drop is also equal to the voltage drop across this inductor. In other words, it's equal to the expression given in this annotation here. In other words, we have that V2 is equal to this expression here. And this gives us this second equation. The next step in the solution is to take the Fourier transform of each of these two equations here. To begin with, I'll consider the first of these two equations. In other words, the equation that involves little v1. In order to take the Fourier transform of this equation, the only property of the Fourier transform that we need to use, other than the linearity property, is the differentiation property due to this particular term here, which involves a derivative. So the differentiation property is what's stated in this annotation here. And essentially, the differentiation property says that each time we take a derivative in the time domain, the effect that this has on the Fourier transform is it multiplies the Fourier transform by j omega. So when we take the Fourier transform of this term here, we're going to get a multiplication by j omega, which is what we obtain here. And the remaining terms in this equation are quite straightforward to take the Fourier transform of. Essentially, we're just using the linearity property. So when all is said and done, we end up with the Fourier transform of little v1, which is denoted as big V1, is given by this particular equation here. And then of course we can factor the i of omega out of the two terms on the right hand side to obtain this next line here. So now we have the Fourier transform big V1. Now we proceed to take the Fourier transform of this equation. And to do this, we can simply observe that we've already taken the Fourier transform of an expression that looks identical to this one on the right-hand side, namely this particular expression here. So we can just copy the result that we had from earlier, and this gives us this particular Fourier transform for the Fourier transform of little v2, which we're denoting as big V2. Next, we can observe that since the system we're dealing with is LTI, it must satisfy an equation of the form shown in the annotation here. In particular, we have that the Fourier transform of the output of the system, which is denoted as big V2, is equal to the Fourier transform of the input of the system, which is denoted big V1, times the frequency response of the system, which is denoted as big H. Now, of course, we can rearrange this equation and solve for big H. If we do this, we end up with big H is equal to big V2 over big V1. So if we can find a ratio of big V2 to big V1, this will give us the frequency response big H of the system. And this is precisely what we're looking for in part A of this problem. So keeping this equation in mind, in other words, we have that big H is equal to big V2 over big V1, we can take the formula for big V1 that we obtained above and the formula for big V2 that we obtained above, and we can substitute them into the right-hand side of this equation here. And if we do this, what we end up with is this next line. And next, we can observe that the i of omega that appears in the numerator and denominator can be canceled. And if we do this, this leads to this next line here. So now we have an expression for h of omega, in other words, the frequency response, which is given by this expression here. And this completes part A of the problem. At this point, I'm going to scroll the example upwards so we can see the next part of the solution. Now we move on to part B of the example. Recall that in part B of the example, we were asked to find the response of the system to the input little v1, where little v1 is given by this particular formula here. 
The intention behind this particular part of the example is again to use the Fourier transform. So to begin with, we're going to take the Fourier transform of little v1. And to do this, we can use our Fourier transform table because the signum function that we need to take the Fourier transform of appears in our table. So looking up the answer in our table, we have the Fourier transform of little v1, which we denote as big v1, is given by this particular formula here. Next, we can recall from earlier that the system that we're working with is governed by this particular equation here. So in part A of the problem, we found big H, the frequency response of the system, and above we found big V1. So we can substitute the expressions that we found earlier for big H and big V1 into this right-hand side. And when we do this, this gives us this next line here. At this point, we can now cancel the common factor of j omega in the numerator and denominator to get to the next line. Now at this point we want to find little v2 because this is what we're being asked to find in part b of the problem. So we're going to simply take the inverse Fourier transform of big v2 to find little v2. So taking the inverse Fourier transform of big v2 we trivially obtain this next line here where we now need to simplify this inverse Fourier transform expression that appears on this line. So to begin with, we can divide both the numerator and denominator by L, which gives us this next line here. And we can then use the linearity property to pull this factor of 2 outside of the for inverse Fourier transform operation, which gives us this next line here. And then as it turns out, the inverse Fourier transform that appears on this line is something that we can look up in our table. So this is what we're going to do next. At this point, I need to pause in order to scroll the example upwards so we can see the last part of the solution. Finally, we proceed to compute this inverse Fourier transform here. And in order to do this, we use our Fourier transform table. It turns out that there's a pair in our table which allows us to handle an inverse Fourier transform of this form. Essentially, it's something that looks like 1 over a constant plus g omega. In other words, we can use this particular Fourier transform pair here in the annotation. So the inverse Fourier transform of something that looks like 1 over a constant plus g omega is a real exponential function times a unit step. So by taking the inverse Fourier transform here, we end up with this next line here. And this is our final answer for part B. We're asked to find the function little v2, in other words, the response of the system to the input little v1. And this is what we obtain.